Hello everyone, it is going on 9 a.m. on February 1st and today I am starting off my vlog going through all of my Wheel of D20 books. So I decided to do a reading vlog for this because I wasn't going to be doing weekly vlogging since I did that for the last couple of months and especially with Battle of the Bookish I wanted to kind of have this month to be a little bit more chill. So this is going to be a vlog that spans over the course of the entire month of February dedicated like I said to my Wheel of D20 books. So I have five books for this month that I will be working with and I'm kind of excited because all except for one are one I was excited for. There's one of them that I'm not super jazzed about but it's because it's a classic and it's an old one. So anyway first thing that we're going to be working with today uh, is my first prompt which was my middle grade prompt that is The Jumbies by Tracy Baptiste. This is a middle grade kind of fantasy like urban fantasy of sorts. This I think if I remember correctly has a lot of influence from uh, Caribbean folklore. I think it has something to do with a kind of demonic entity. It is a trilogy and I have the entire trilogy, but the only one that I need to read this month is the first one, The Jumbies. And I have my next prompt, which is for a hated trope uh, prompt, which I have Snow Like Ashes by Sarah Rosh for. The trope that I don't like within this is the idea, especially in fantasy, where there's always the one character who is usually the main character that thinks it is best for them to go on the journey by themselves. And you, we always know it never works out. Like, it's never a good idea to go on your own on some kind of perilous journey. So I really dislike that trope because I don't think it ever makes sense. And I don't understand why it always comes up, especially in fantasy, but it's whatever. Then next I have the indigenous author slash characters prompt, which basically means either I have to read a book that is written by an indigenous author or has indigenous characters in the sense that like they are from the land that the story is from. And for this I have Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. This is one of my most anticipated read of the month because I have heard nothing but good things about this one. Then I have the rant prompt, which basically means I have to do some kind of a review for this, whether it's a rant of how much I liked it, rant of how much I disliked it, or even a rant of how lukewarm I felt about it. So for this, I have Republic by Plato, which I am not really excited about. I am really sad that this is the one that I ended up winning for this because the other one was going to be an Amanda Lovelace poetry collection, which I was much more excited to read, but the cards did not end up going in my way. So that this is what I'll have to work with. And then the last book that I have is for my standalone prompt, which is just to read a standalone. And for that, I have Love and Luck by Jenna Evans Welch. This is a young adult contemporary. I have a bit of a weird time with young adult contemporaries, but I'm hoping I'll like this one because for some reason, young adult contemporaries are not jiving with me, or at least a very specific few, because I feel like in general, young adult contemporaries that aren't like super romance focused do seem to do better for me. But ones like this where romance is kind of the heavy-handed idea of the story does not seem to gel well with me. But I do like adult romances. Like, that's a whole other thing. So anyway, those are the five books I will be going over this month. So I am hoping to get through them fairly quick in the month. I have a reading schedule set up like I do almost every month. And the hope is that by the time it gets to about the 10th, I'll have finished all five of them but it's also going to depend on how this month goes for me because if I if January was of any indication of how this month might go for me it might not go as well as I had hoped hi guys so it is the next day it is about almost nine o'clock in the morning on the second and I am over halfway done with the jumpies as of now let me actually check my kindle because I ended up reading quite a bit this morning uh, before I started work. I'm on page 168 currently. I'm almost 75% of the way through. It's definitely pretty scary in terms of the fact that this is literally dealing with a bunch of kids who accidentally unearth these things called jumbies, which are basically like some kind of demonic entity. I'm not 100% certain or there's some kind of evil spirit. But I feel like I just did not really get into it until like the last maybe 25%. And I don't know if that's because I just wasn't paying attention or what, but I just didn't really feel like I got into the story until about 
literally halfway through. The main character's having to possibly try to save her dad. And she's found out some things about herself and where she came from and about her mother who's been dead for so many years by this point. And it's definitely interesting in that respect, but I feel like other than that, we didn't really do a lot. And I feel like it's kind of just been really boring up to this point. So anyway, I, like I said, have another like 70 some pages left of it. Like I don't have much of it left. I should be able to finish it today and I'm actually going to get ready to read some of it during my break but I think at this point it's going to be kind of like a three star and if that changes at all I'll let you guys know but I mean at this point I don't feel like it's too early to call the rating on it just because I feel like I don't have a lot to say on it truthfully. <laughs> Hello everybody, um, it's been a few days and I have not been updating you like I should because since the last clip I have read and finished two more books on my Wheel of D20 TBR. It's currently now 8.11 in the morning on February 7th. Oh boy, okay so first of all the last two books I've read have both been four stars really really enjoyed them um i also got my hair cut over the weekend so i just have basically it got thinned out and i had some layers put in it and i got a little fringe bang whatever you want to call it angled bang some kind like that i got through the entirety of snow like ashes by sarah rosh um i really liked this one i was actually more surprised with this one because i do remember when i got this copy that people who had read it had very kind of low ratings for it because there was a lot of people saying that it was very not like other girls kind of thing and so it, it fell to a lot of the tropes that most people don't like when it comes to young adult fantasy. Now I would highly disagree with that and I don't know what it is about this but just from beginning to end Everything about it was really interesting. I love the idea of the world, which is centered around the idea that there are different seasons and then what are called different rhythms. Essentially, this book talks about there's been this war going on and you kind of start in the middle of how things have been happening for a long time, where for the last like 16 years, there's been this war on essentially eradicating the entirety of the Winter Kingdom. And there's not really a clear idea as to why, other than basically the fact that there is a king by the name of Angra who rules the Spring Kingdom, who basically just has become bloodthirsty and he wants to take over the entire world, which then leads him to essentially massacre the Winterian Kingdom and leaves only a small amount of citizens left. Whoever are left are basically taken into slave camps and are worked to literal death. And the main character, Mira, is one of 25 other people that were able to escape. But she was a baby when this happened. She has no memory of anything. She doesn't know who her family is. She was taken in by the former general of the queen that was in the kingdom and they also have her only son who is named Mather and Mira and Mather basically have been lifelong friends. They've grown up together. They have spent a lot of time together training because they're basically the same age. What they've basically been trying to do up to this point is obtain what is called a half of a locket. So in this world, basically, all of the kingdoms have a way of using magic through these things they call conduits. These conduits essentially are a powerhouse of magical abilities, and each of the kingdoms has one particular one that allows them to use magic. The Winterian one, though, was stolen by the Spring Kingdom, by this guy Angra, and they have to basically go and get those two pieces in order to have some idea of can they save their Winterian kingdom because even with the conduit they don't know for sure if like they can save their kingdom but it at least gives them the ability to have their power back and hopefully be able to have some kind of a fighting chance against Angra who is like extremely evil like he is the baddest of the bad in terms of this world and in the very beginning you learn that Mira basically decides to not necessarily go on her own but she tries to go on her own to obtain a half of this locket and 
essentially it kickstarts this whole thing of like trying to escape the spring kingdom and other things involved with it. I will say there's a bit of a love V as opposed to a love triangle going on within this. Mira not only has Mather, who she is very quickly, you realize, in love with him, has been for a long time. They've had this kind of almost romance, but they can't have anything because of the fact that Mather's going to be king and he can't really have any distractions in terms of romantic interest because of the fact that it could distract, like I said, distract him from what it is he needs to do. Um, but there is another love interest that comes in much later in the book. And there is this idea of like marriage of convenience in a sense that comes in. And I can't say much more than that because it's much further into the book that this comes up. And there's a lot of things though that I will say surround around this marriage of convenience that brings to light a lot of the deep-seated social issues that are involved in this world. It basically is described that the Winterians are looked down upon by many of the other kingdoms. I really, really enjoyed this. I felt that it was not at all what I thought people had been saying about it, where I found Mira to actually be very interesting, a little bit impulsive at times, but makes sense because a lot of her story is trying to get the attention of the general who's basically raised her. He has told her, you find out at the very beginning many times that she is not allowed to go out and fight. She's not allowed to do anything in terms of fighting. And you really don't know why. He never gives a straight answer. And that's what's one of the most frustrating things for Mira is that she wants to go fight. She wants to help her friends and family essentially protect you know themselves and go after this locket which is part of the reason why she ends up going not really on her own but on her own to get half of the locket like this whole story follows her in terms of not only learning about herself but really learning about what's what is the real issue in terms of what has been going on with this world because there's a lot of things that are not really told she has very little information about you know, what had happened. She doesn't have any memories of what happened when her kingdom was attacked because she was, like I said, a baby. And there's a lot of questions surrounding around to the death of the queen that was holding the kingdom because her death was very mysterious. They don't know what exactly happened because she wasn't necessarily killed. She just kind of died and nobody really knows what exactly happened with that. So there's a lot of questions that kind of get brought up in this series that I really enjoyed and a lot of them were answered. I really like how I felt that this was a very satisfying first book and I think a trilogy and it felt like while we had a lot of other questions that still had not really 100% been answered, a large portion of them were and they were the questions I think that were incredibly important to get answered in this first book. So the only things I will say I feel like I didn't jive with as much are I think that, like I said, Mira was a little too impulsive sometimes, but also there were a couple of points where I was a little confused on, on things on how like exactly, you know, things worked out. And I can't say what without spoiling things, but there were a couple low points that I felt were really dragging. But overall, this book was fairly short for how it felt. Like I genuinely felt like I had read more along the lines of like a full-fledged adult fantasy novel that's like over 500 pages instead of a book that was like 350 pages. Like there was so much packed into this that I did not expect it to be as short as it was. And it was a very fast read. It was a fun read. I had a really good time with this and I'm really interested in being able to read the other two books in this series when I get a chance. And then last night, I actually, in about three days, had finished Black Sun by Rebecca Rowan Horse. This one was a little bit more of a disappointment. I still gave it four stars, but I feel like the plot was amazing. That I will never knock. I really liked the idea of the plot. And I did eventually really come to understand all of the perspectives that were involved with this because there's four perspectives that play into this. One that does not come in until a about, I would say a third of the way through, maybe about halfway through. But I feel like the issue I had with this is very nitpicky for me. 
And that is that I feel like the time jumps that went on in this book were very disorienting. We would have so many chapters that were kind of more in the present time following certain perspectives and then we would get to one particular character that we see the first chapter of the book of when he's a young man, Serapio. And Serapio's chapters were fine like in the ones in the present time but when we would have to jump back in time to see some of the things he had gone through growing up it was a little disorienting. I felt that it would have been much better suited if we had maybe seen some of what exactly happened to him earlier in the book and more in a chronological kind of standpoint. They're the only ones that jump back in time at all, really. And I felt that they just really pulled me out of the story. And while they were definitely in interesting in terms of understanding the character and kind of more of what he had gone through up to this point in the story, it just, it didn't sit well with me. And I think that it's because I just felt that it should have all been stuff that we learned at the beginning, you know? Like I feel, and that's being very, very nitpicky with me, but it's something I can't ignore because it did affect my enjoyment of the story, truthfully. I felt that I could not really enjoy this as much with that being the issue. But the plot I really enjoyed. I loved the overall idea of the story that was going on. I loved the idea of all of the characters that were involved and the different perspectives we had involved in the story. I am curious to see how book two is going to be because that's supposed to get released here fairly soon. And I know that this originally was supposed to be, I, I'm pretty sure, a standalone, but because of the amount of love that it received, it ended up being where it was going to be at least a duology, maybe a trilogy. I don't know. But I really did like a lot of what this involved. And if you don't know what this is about, essentially it follows, like I said, four perspectives that are all surrounding, surrounding around the bringing on of the winter solstice, which then also brings on a, a solar eclipse. And this is placed in like the pre-Columbian time. Essentially, we follow, like I said, four different people. We have Serapio, who is, like I said, the very first chapter of the book. And you learn in the first chapter in a very graphic scene. Like, this is a very adult, very, in some ways, grim, dark, almost kind of story. Not fully, but there are definitely some very dark and twisted parts of this book. You see that his mother in the very first chapter essentially goes through this ritual to create him into a vessel of a god and she sews his eyelids shut and it is incredibly graphic like it is it is intense and then his mother basically says that like there's some something that's going to happen much later on in his life because mind you when he's when this is happening he's like eight, 10 years old, like he's a kid, like a little kid. And this is happening to him. And he's kind of letting it happen because he trusts his mother. He thinks that this is supposed to be what's supposed to happen because of his mother's um, religion, whatever it is that there is. So anyway, you learn that through her, through his mother, she tells him that at one point he is going to go back to their homeland and essentially bring about this thing. We don't know what, but we know that there's something in the works that's going to happen years down the line. And then we meet our other three characters. We have um, Ziala. She is basically a, what's called a teak. It's basically a type of person within this world. And she is a captain. She's a sea captain. She uses the ships to go and travel. And that's how she makes her money. Well, she is charged with taking basically Serapio to this place years later. This like it jumps forward about, I want to say like 10, like 12, 14 years later, something like that. Like a good chunk of time has gone on. And she's charged with taking Serapio to Tova, which is his homeland by this man named Lord Balam, who is basically like one of the men involved in like the the merchant families like kind of not mafia-esque but similar in the sense that people are can be afraid of them whatever the case may be so she's charged with taking him there and she learns about him and that's kind of like their story is them learning about each other and we see obviously Serapio and what he's going through and what his plans are in terms of when he gets home then we have another character named Narampa who is a young woman who is what's called a sun priest. She's basically a part of this religious group that helps to bring about the 
kind of preparations involved with the solstice and with the eclipse. And you find out that somebody is trying to kill Narampa. There is a group called the Carrion Crows who are not necessarily a big fan of the Sky Maid and uh, people which are like the, the religious group. They're not a fan of them because of previous things that have happened in, in the past where like a lot of them were killed supposedly by this religious group, even though that's not been founded. It, they believe that this religious group had a hand in killing many of their, their clan. And so they believe, the religious group believes that somebody is out to get and kill Narampa. And there's a lot of political stuff involved within this religious group that goes on. And I will say within this group, there is a character that uses not they, them pronouns, but Zizir pronouns where it's like X, E, X, I, R, you know, those kinds of things. The last perspective we have is from this man, like I said, that comes in partway through the story named Okoa. And Okoa is essentially the son of the matron of the Carrion Crow clan. And there's something that goes on that basically calls him to step up and essentially figure out what's happened. All while this whole thing is happening with the solstice impending or what they call the convergence. They call the solar eclipse the convergence. And it's basically starting off about 20 days before that's happening all the way up to the day of the convergence and when the convergence happens. So very interesting story. Again, I feel like I still really enjoy this, but I cannot ignore the issue of the timeline aspect involved in this because I think it very much affected my enjoyment of the story because I was taken so many times out of the story by the jumping back in the timeline. Both of these books I rated four stars. I really enjoyed the both of them. Little things here and there I kind of had issues with but I think both of them were still fantastic fantasy books. I like flew through them. I was so impressed with what I read. All right, so it is the next day and I DNF'd this at about 30 pages. I don't know what it is about YA contemporaries like this, but I cannot stomach them. From the first page, it was nothing but like cringe feelings. And the whole first chapter was also like a cringe fest. And I just could not see myself getting through this without feeling miserable. And I'm not about to do that to myself. I am not going to go into this year with anything that is not making me happy, is not making me interested. Okay? So there's that. DNF is at 30 pages. I think the biggest thing about this was it was supposed to be this story where essentially like there's these this sip these two siblings okay brother and a sister and they've always been super close but it starts off just after this wedding that they both went to for their aunt in Ireland and they were basically supposed to then go both to Italy for a couple of days to visit um, a friend of the main character Addie's well the two of them get into this all out brawl at the wedding over something that we barely get any idea of, but it has something to do with, I think, Addie's boyfriend or something like that. And it causes her and her brother to have this like massive rift between the two of them. And their mother makes this really stupid decision that doesn't seem to make really any sense that if they can go to Italy and make things work and reconcile, they will then be able to continue their sports things, which for both of them is really important. The brother, Ian, is a football player and then Addie is a soccer player. And both of them play very competitively, especially at like a really competitive school. And essentially it will, they both have the ability to obtain scholarships with their sport to go to college. And so it's really important for them to stay in those teams. I don't understand the idea of punishing them in their sports that's gonna 
possibly do well for them in terms of their college education. Like, I think that is the most ridiculous kind of punishment for from a parent. It's one thing for a kid to go like on academic probation in a sense where like they don't have the grades to continue playing and like that being an issue. But to punish them for something that is not having to do with anything with school or being on the team in general and making it a punishment where they can't even play the sport that's supposed to get them you know, hopefully into college, like that doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand why that is the punishment. And like, I just also immediately could not stand the main character. Again, I don't know what it is about YA contemporaries that look and sound similar to this that are like heavy on the romantic aspect. I can't do it. It is cringy. It is absolutely ridiculous. And they're not fun for me. They're really not. So because I have DNF this, I haven't really discussed this in terms of like how I'm going to handle DNFs with my wheel of D20 prompts in terms of like whether it's considered completed or not. I am going to consider it completed because I did reach 10% of this book. The book is like 299 pages. And so I did reach 10% by getting to page 30. So my goal has always been with DNFs to at least read 10% of the book before finally giving it like officially a DNF because I feel like 10% gives us a good chunk of the story to where like I can see whether or not I'm going to be interested in it. Now this is like I said a much shorter book so it doesn't have as much I can say that like is involved with it because you know I only read 30 pages of the of it but that's still 10%. I'm not going to punish myself for not enjoying something that is for a prompt. Good morning all. So it is just after 8 a.m. I'm just getting started with work for the day and I'm here to wrap up this vlog because I ended up DNFing Republic by Plato at 46 pages. I was 13% of the way through the book. And what, Oscar? Hold on. I think he needs mama snowballs. Ouch! Oh, that really hurt, Baba. Owie. Okay, apparently he needs mama snuggles, but he also needs to claw mom in the face. Oh, careful, watch your head. So essentially what this whole thing is, is it's just basically a kind of not really fictionalized account of how Plato essentially comes to various discussions about um, the idea of justice and like how it is something that is like dependent on not only the person but also the situation in terms of like who is considered the just versus the unjust, what is justice versus injustice, and how does it apply to certain ideas. But I was so fucking bored, which I'm not surprised by. I knew I was going to be with this, but I got to like page 46. I was in part way through book two and I just, I could not do it. I could not continue. And I was not going to force myself to. I was going to try to finish it though because I wanted to make the rant prompt something that was going to require me to finish the book that I was going to have to do a, review, a rant review on. But I, I continue to think about it and the thing that I think makes the most sense is that all of the prompts should be able to be DNF'd if I feel so inclined to. I don't want to restrict myself and force myself to read something that I'm not enjoying. So I kind of came to the decision that a rule that's going to be enacted within the rest of the Wheel of D20 games is that no matter what prompt it is, I have the ability to DNF something and it still count toward completing a prompt if I DNF it at least 10% of the way through which I think is more than fair. I think that it gives me a fair shot of a book. Now, this is going to be dependent on how long the book itself is. So 10% for a 350-page book is going to be different than 10% for a 
500 page book or a thousand page book. I kind of want this to be something where it is going to challenge me in a sense to at least give something a strong attempt, but it does give me also then the ability to at least try and make through a certain point. Like there's a goal in mind for each book I read for this game of Wheel of D20. So essentially though, it does then also give me the ability to, to keep enjoying what I am reading and not focus on books that I'm not enjoying, but give me enough of a challenge to where if I can get through 10% of the book, that is a good spot to stop and be able to DNF. And who knows, there might be points where I read more like 25% of the book and then I decide to DNF it. it. It really depends because each book is different. With these two books in, in themselves, it was 10% I got through and I just was kind of like, I really don't want to read anymore. I'm bored. I'm annoyed. We're done with this kind of thing. So that being said, my Wheel of D20 reads for this month are now complete. That's great. That means that I have won the Wheel of D20 for February and I can spend the rest of the month working on the other reads that I had planned. Also, the fact that I got through all five books within the first little bit more than a week of the month is really good. I stuck to my reading schedule pretty well this so far this month, so I'm pretty proud of myself. So the first thing I read this month was The Jumbies by Tracy Baptiste. I gave this a three out of five stars and this was for the prompt for middle grade. Then I read Snow Like Ashes, which was for the prompt of Hated Trope. This one included a trope where a character decides to go off on their own to solve a problem as opposed to taking on a group. And I really hate that trope. I think it is very dumb, but I ended up giving this a four out of five stars. Then I read Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse for the prompt of indigenous characters or authors. And this had indigenous characters that were kind of in a pre-Columbian area. And I gave this a four to five stars as well. Then I DNF'd Love and Luck by Jenna Evans Welch. This was for the prompt to read a standalone. And then I DNF'd Republic by Plato, which was for the prompt of a rant review. So overall, the Wheel of D20 books were not too bad. I am a little disappointed that two of the five were DNF's, but I would much rather have an honest opinion of what exactly all these books are like in order to get through my library than, you know, read through them and then have very lukewarm feelings and kind of feel like I wasted my time in some way, if that makes sense. That is going to be it for this vlog. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I will be planning on doing these vlogs once a month with all of the D20 books I will be reading for that current month. So because I won this month's Wheel of D20 books, I then get to only have to pick four books for next month, which is going to be very interesting. So we'll see if I can continue on this hot streak of getting through the books early in the month and then being able to read whatever else I want. If this is how the rest of the months go for this entire game of Wheel of D20, then I am going to have a very, very good time. Like if this is how the months are going, going to go, I should have no problem with being able to get to the end of the game of Wheel of D20 and winning a mood read month, hopefully in time for the next round of Battle of the Bookish. That's the hope. But anyway, thank you guys so much for joining me in this video. If you guys did enjoy it, please do give it a big thumbs up. And if you haven't already and you'd like to be and would like to see more content like this, go ahead and hit the button down below and subscribe to become an owl at Narflock. And I will see all of you guys in my next video. Bye guys.